Amen. 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 All right, so here in Romans chapter 12, um, so the uh, part of the ch chapter I want to focus on is uh, just look at uh, verse 17, 17 and 18. 17 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. It says, provide, uh, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You know, so God, God wants uh, to have, you know, a people. God wants to have a holy people that represent who he is and, and, and holiness and uh, a people that, you know, hunger after righteousness. And he wants a people that are full of uh, love and, and humility. And I think that uh, we hear a lot about uh, soul winning and we always hear a lot about, you know, doing good works. And I think a lot of the time when we hear about doing good works, our mind just immediately jumps to the best good work we can do which is win someone to Christ. But the Bible talks a lot about good works, and a lot of it has nothing to do with soul. I mean, we as Christians are commanded to, well, 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. I mean, that's a commandment. And then it says, provide honest things in the sight of all men. Now, all men is all men. So it's not just brethren. It's not just, you know, the people um, that we see every Sunday morning uh, Sunday night and Wednesday night, you know, a lot of the times, 90% of our life is out in the world. You know, we are commanded, we're, we're not of the world, we are in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. And so we, as God's people, need to be representatives and have a good report to them that are without, to people that are not of the church. So the sermon tonight is going to be geared more towards doing good works, but specifically to the people that are without the church. If you would, go to uh, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> I'll read to you uh, Luke 14. Luke 14 says, Luke 14, 34, salt is good. Now we heard that a lot before, right? Salt is good. But if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? Mark 9, 50 again. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost lost his saltness, wherewith will ye season it? So it says salt is good, but if it's lost its savor, if it's lost its, lost its saltiness, what is it good for, right? So to us, our physical tongue, you know, salt is good. I mean, whenever you taste something savory or you taste something salty to your, to your taste buds, to your mind, man, that's good. The, the more salt it is in it, Usually it's pretty good. Amen. I mean, bacon is really salty, right? So, I mean, bacon is really good. But salt is good, and the, it uses that because, well, I'll show you in, in the latter half of not Mark 9.50, it says, salt is good, but if it, the salt has lost the saltiness, wherewith shall you, shall you season it? Then it says this, have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. So have salt in yourselves, what does that mean? How do we have peace one with another? Is it just one with another with just the brethren? Or are we the salt of the world, right? And that's why you're there in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, in verse 13, it says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? So now we get a clue here. Salt is not just good, and if it loses its saltiness, it's not good for anything. But we as, as believers are the salt of the earth. Now, what does that mean? It says later on, it says, It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot. Colossians 4, 5 says, Walk in wisdom to them, toward them that are without, redeeming the time. So who are them that are without? It's the people without the church. The people you come in contact with all the time. We need to be redeeming the time and walk in wisdom to them that are without. Now, what's walking in wisdom? Where, what's a book in the Bible where we get all of our wisdom? Proverbs, right? The book of Proverbs. Book of Proverbs. Well, let me finish that. It says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. So now we're the salt of the earth. And how are we the salt of the earth? We're seasoned with salt. Our speech is to be seasoned with salt. So what does that mean? Salt is good, right? It's good to your taste. The things that we say ought to be good to the things that hear it to the people that are without. And that's why it says, with, with walk in wisdom to them that are without. When I think of walking in wisdom, I think of that proverb, it says, a soft answer turneth away wrath, right? So you need to have wisdom. You need to have wisdom from the Bible to know how to answer a matter. 
to know how to turn away wrath when you're in the world. You know, maybe it's a boss, maybe it's someone in the world who's very upset at you. But if you had wisdom, if you're speaking with salt, then it, it would turn away wrath. You would know how to answer that person. So we as Christians need to have a saltiness about us. We need to walk and talk with salt. Matthew uh, 5, 14. Look at verse 14. Not, not only we are salt, but it says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle, but put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So the, 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 the application here is that ye are the salt of the earth, ye are the light of the world. Again, this is to people, everyone, the whole world, the entire earth. You are supposed to be the light, and you're not supposed to hide that light. You're supposed to put it on a candlestick. You're supposed to let it shine. You're supposed to be talking seasoned with salt. Man. And can you reach everybody? No. But that's why it says, and it giveth light unto them all that are in the house. How, how can we apply that? Is basically when there's a candle, it lights on everyone in the house. It basically lights on anyone in close proximity. Right. So basically anyone you come in close proximity to, anyone that you come in contact with, you need to be a light unto that person. And how are we going to be the light? What are they supposed to see? It says, that they may see your good works. What's the reason? And glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's the purpose of Christians. I mean, yeah, we're supposed to be winning the loss of Christ, but the Bible talks so much more about the Christian life, and the Christian life is all about doing good works, and it's not about doing good works, well, it's not only about doing good works to your brethren, a lot of it has to do with to them that are without. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 15. We see this again, another famous uh, parable spoken by Jesus, but uh, also it has the application of soul winning, and that's how we've heard it all the time, but there's, there's an also another application I think we could make. In John, uh, John chapter 15, verse 1, it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Right? So we're the branches, the father's the husbandman, and then the fruit branches, the branches that don't bring fruit, he cuts off. And the branches that do bring fruit, he purges it so that it brings forth more fruit. And it says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now here's a commandment. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him, and the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. See, because without Christ, you can't bring forth good works. Right. You know, in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Right. If all you have is flesh, you cannot bring forth good works. Right. That's what the Bible says. You must be in Christ to bring forth good fruit. And you need to be walking in the Spirit once you have Christ. You need to be uh, walking in Christ. It says, if any man abide in me, he is, sorry, if any man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So it's the same thing as being with salt, right? If the salt has lost its saltiness or its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? What is it good for? It's good for nothing. It's to be trodden underfoot of men, the Bible says, right? Well, if you're not walking in the Spirit, if you're not in Christ, you can't bring forth good fruit. You're a branch that's not bringing forth good fruit. And what good is that to God? It is henceforth good for nothing. To be trodden underfoot. To be cut off and thrown into the fire. Now, people always obviously run and take that to say you're going to burn in hell. But, you know, once you're saved, you're always saved. You can never lose your salvation. This is talking about walking in Christ or not walking in Christ. You don't walk in Christ, you're not going to bring forth fruit. Walking in Christ is bringing forth fruit. And then verse 7, it says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. So just like 
Just like in Matthew, when it says, let your light so shine before men that they, those that are without, that they may see your good works. And what's the reason? So that you can glorify your Father in heaven. That's the point. You're an ambassador. You know, when you're a Christian, whether you signed up for it or not, you are, you have a big red, you know, Christ written all over you that people are going to look at you and apply that to Christ. You know, just whether you like it or not, you and everything you do to the world, that's what they're going to think a Christian is. That's how they think a Christian should act. And so you bringing forth good fruit is going to be a good testimony, a good witness for your Father in heaven. And herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. <clears throat> so, disciples are God's people. But it says in... Um, let me just read to you here. It says, but ye are a chosen generation. Oh yeah, 1 Peter 2, 9. You don't have to turn there. 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, because we're the disciples of Christ. It says, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people. So we're set forth, we're set out of the world. We're still in the world, but we're not of the world. We're, we've been changed. We've been sanctified through the Holy Ghost. So now that we're a peculiar people, it says that ye should show forth the praises of him, the Father, who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous, uh, marvelous light. Our good works are supposed to glorify our Father to his marvelous light. Which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which have obtained mercy, but now, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, war against the soul, which war against the soul, having your conversation, listen to this, having your conversation honest among who? Among the Gentiles. Now, obviously, this is First Peter saying he's talking to the Israelites, but obviously this is applied to spiritual Israel as well, you know, all those who are saved. So spiritual Israel, those who are saved, who are the Gentiles, the unsaved, right? So he says, having your conversation among the Gentiles, that wherein as they speak, they speak against you as evildoers, that they by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So it says that they by your good works, which they shall behold. The Gentiles shall behold your works. Now, whether it's good or bad is up to you. But we need how to have a good testimony outside of the church to those that are with us, to, to those that need God. So that was my first point. His first point is that good works are not just for the house of God, just to the people of God. And I think that's that's pretty that's pretty um, understandable. You know that um, Bible says that um, we know that we have passed from from death into life because we love the brethren. It kind of like comes with the Spirit, basically. Once you have the Holy Spirit, you love those who were born of the same Spirit. It's just something that you have in you. It's kind of something natural, but it's a lot harder to have good works and to love those that don't love you, to love those that are not, uh, that only have the flesh, that only have this world who are alone and without God in this world. And hopefully by the grace of God that through your good works and your good testimony, obviously the end goal is to get them saved. But, you know, just on the first day you meet them, if, if you know, God willing, if you can give them the gospel, hey, great. But not, a lot of the times you can't. And a lot of the times it's just you're holding your profession of faith. You're showing your good works so that one day you can give them the gospel. And, hey, you know what? If they don't accept it right then and there, hey, you know what? This guy does believe the gospel. He's a good, hard worker. She's a she's an obedient wife. She's a hard worker at home. You know, whatever the cause, that they can glorify your Father, which is in heaven, because of you. And then maybe consider, you know, accepting the gospel later on. So point number one is that good works are to all men, not just people in the church, and to every unbeliever. So if you would, turn to me to, uh, turn if you would to Luke chapter... Uh, let me look that up here. If you would turn to, let me turn to something else. Turn to uh, 
Uh, just stay in loop, actually. Just stay in loop. I'll tell you where in a second. Hang on. Wrote down the verse, but not the chapter. Luke 10. Sorry, Luke 10. Let me read to you Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. So now that we know we need to do good works, the good works is something that we're expected of. Because we're vines. We're salt of the earth. We're the light of the earth. This is so clear. It's throughout the entire New Testament that we're the people of God now. Old Testament too. You know, obviously Old Testament, they, they, they were to a light to the Gentiles. And the things don't change. But, you know, people, the Queen of Sheba, you know, heard of the great things about, you know, King Solomon and the, and the, and the tribe of Israel and how they ran everything and how they, you know, glorified God. And then she gets there and asks all these questions. And then she's blown away, right, by just how obedient the servants are and how happy everyone is. So, you know, she obviously heard of a good report. She was she was them that were armed without, and she still heard a good report to come all the way to King Solomon to hear the word of God. Uh, you know, Romans chapter 13, you know, so now that we know we need to do all things to all men, but what good works, right? So, I mean, there's plenty of good works we can do. What are the good works? Well, in Romans chapter 13, let me read you this. Romans chapter 13, verse 9, it says, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So one thing is obviously, I think the easier part is to, when you have good works, when you get saved and have good works, it's to stop doing the evil. Right? It's to stop doing the sins. It's getting the sins out of your life. Right? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. These are all things that we should not do. That is, thou shalt not bear false witness. It's easy to not do something. Right? If you're doing something, it's, it's easy to re refrain from doing it. Right? That would be the easier way of advocating, applying good works. It's getting the sin out of your life. That, because that's why it says, For thou... It says, it's briefly comprehended in the saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So by not doing evil to your neighbor, obviously, that kind of goes in hand in hand with, you know, you, you, you're, you're doing good works to your brother when you're not sinning against them, basically. And it says, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, the love of, therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So it's really easy to just not do bad things. But what I want to do is promote you to good works. We need to be zealous of good works. And what, what, what does that mean? Well, you're there in Luke chapter um, 10. Luke chapter 10. Let me turn there myself. So we have the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? And that starts in, uh, let's start in uh, chapter, sorry, verse 27. Verse 27, it says, In answering, he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto them, Thou hast done right. Do this, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Right? So here's a bit of a list of sins. It's like, you know, what say, uh, how readest thou? You know, what, what's written in the law? And he says, thou shalt not do this, don't do this, don't do this. He says, Jesus says, um, do this and thou shalt live. And then he tries to justify himself. Well, let's see what happens. He says, and Jesus answering and said, a certain man went down to Jerusalem, to Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he saw, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by the other side. Right. So here's this man coming from Jerusalem to Jericho. Um, you know, probably a Jew, I would assume, because it, it applies to this how it's a Jew going from Jeruz uh, Jerusalem to Jericho. But here we have two. Levites, two Jews, if you will, a priest and a Levite, coming to him and seeing him, 
that he's in need. He's been robbed and he's almost near death. And what do they do? They pass by on the other side. And it says, and by, and by chance there came down a certain priest, I'm sorry, verse um, uh, 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on, and set him on his own bread, on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. So here we have someone who's not of, you know, the Jewish, um, who's not of Israel, basically. Basically, they're half, you know, Jews, if you will. They're that um, Samaritans and, and Jews combined. It's a Samaritan. It's someone who's not supposed to have any, um, you know, dealings with, you know, the Jews because they, they have, you know, the Jews, you know, and they think they're better than the Samaritans. But here's a Samaritan who had compassion on him. And he took care of him and bound up his wounds. And it says, And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto them, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was the neighbor, neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? So Jesus proposes this question. He says, Which one of these three thinkest thou was the neighbor of him that are among the thieves. So was it the two Levites that passed by, the guy that was in need, or was it the Samaritan? Well, obviously, it was the Samaritan, right? And then he says, and he says, and he said, he that showeth mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. So that's a commandment, right? That's a commandment from God, and I guess the title of this sermon would be, go and do thou likewise. Because that's a commandment from God, and what is he applying this to? He's applying to the people who are not of Israel, basically, right? The people that are not of God, you know, we're supposed to be, you know, have brotherly love and fellowship one with another, and we have our fellow laborers. But here we come across someone who's without, a Samaritan, someone that's of this world who needs help and just needs, you know, help, basically. I mean, he's near death. And he says, the person that was a neighbor to him, the person that did good works, the person that loved his neighbor, that didn't do ill to his neighbor, was that Samaritan. And so the commandment from Jesus is to go and do thou likewise. And it's to the unbeliever. The unbeliever is the one that we are supposed to go to and do thou likewise, to show compassion, to show mercy, to show our good works. And you think that, you think that, um, that guy who was beaten up, you think he didn't glorify God? You think he didn't praise God because of that Samaritan and what he did? And hey, here's someone who's not supposed to be talking to me. Or here's someone who, I, maybe he supposed that, hey, he's, a, he's a, a holy man of God. Or maybe he's, you know, I'm not worthy to be talking to him. But he, you know, still found it necessary to help his fellow man. And to found it necessary to, to help him in his time of need. And so I think we, as Christians, the majority of our time out with the world, because that's where we spend it in the world, when we're out um, shopping or when we're out um, working or we're out at, at any time in life, basically, the majority of your week, you're not around saved people. You're around unsaved people, right? And so we need to be like a good Samaritan to help those that are in need and go and, go and do that likewise. If you would, turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, it says, But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I ride unto you. Right? So God... The Apostle Paul says, as, as far as brotherly love, I don't need to write unto you. You guys are awesome, Church of Thessalonica. You guys have brotherly love. You guys care one for another. You, one for another. You have all things. You're in all one mind. You know, if, if someone's lacking in something, you give them what they need, no problem. You're there for them. But as touching brotherly love, you have no need that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Again, that's the Holy Spirit. You're taught of God to love one another, to love your brethren. And then it says this, and indeed ye do it to all the brethren which are out in, in all Macedonia. So they're doing this to all the brethren that are in Macedonia, but watch. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. So we not only need to love the brethren, but we need to increase more and more. And then it says that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without. 
and that ye may have lack of nothing. So here we are, he's, he's compelling them, you guys are doing a great job with Thessalonica, but hey, what? You need to increase more and more. And you need to increase more and more to them that are without. And then it says that ye may have lack of nothing. What's lacking nothing is when you're perfect, when you're complete. And what's the Bible talking about being a complete Christian is when you have faith and you have works. When you have faith and works, you're a complete Christian. And again, it's not always just the works of sowing. It's not always just the works of Bible reading, praying, fasting. Hey, those are great things, but there's people that are dying out there in the world. And you know what? Not all the time do they get to hear your gospel presentation. All they have to do is see your works. And maybe through the hardness of their heart, maybe they have a hard heart that you have to break down. And that only through your good works are you even going to break down that, that wall to eventually give them the gospel. But he is compelling the church of Thessalonica to increase more and more to them that are without. You're there in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Exhort, therefore, first of all, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Yeah. So it says for all men. Not just the people in the church. Not just the people that are in your family. It says, for all men, supplications, prayers, and obsessions, and giving of thanks. Hey, how often do you thank the people, or how often do you thank all men? How often do you thank your, um, your, 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 um, your, you know, your boss at work, or the person you were at the grocery store? Or, uh, you know, how, how often do you pray for your boss? You know, how often do you make intercessions for him? How often do you make intercessions for the people you come in contact with? It says, I exhort you, therefore, it says, for kings and for all that are in authority, that they may, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful lives in a peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. So we need to have godly and honest lives, and we need to be praying for the people that are in charge to leave us alone, basically. I mean, how often do you pray to for the people that are without, that are in leadership, for the people that are in out, that make the laws concerning you? I mean, we need to be praying about those people and make an intercession for them. And then it says this, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our Savior. So prayers, supplications, intercessions, and giving of thanks to all men, to all men, is good and acceptable with God our Savior. 1 Timothy 3, turn to, turn to the next chapter, 1 Timothy 3. These are the, um, the prerequisition or prerequisites. Uh, pre <laughs> prerequisites, I guess. Right? Prerequisites. Yeah. Prerequisites. Thank you. Thank you for that. These are the prerequisites um, that uh, for a pastor, for someone in uh, the, the leadership of the church. And what is one of them? In verse 7, it says, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and be a snare of the devil. This is not something that we should just, you know, think about. This is something that not only should the pastor of the church, the pastor needs to be qualified in this area before he's even ordained as a pastor. Right. And he needs to have a good report with them, to them that are without. Out of all the verses I've shown you already, is it just a pastor that has to have a good report? No. We're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. Uh, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5, just a little bit further down, talking about the... Um, uh, the widows, but we, obviously we can apply to women as well. What good works can we do as women? It says in 1 Timothy 5.10, well reported uh, for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have re relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So the, the, every good work, the last one is just you know kind of open-ended. But here's four things that a woman could do that would be um, showing your good works. And some of them are, you know, the, not only the washing the saints' feet or being cute, humble, I guess you could lie. I mean, some people wash feet, some people don't. But in this church, you know, even if we're washing feet or not, what's the point of washing feet? It's being humble. And to being humble to them, to the uh, saints, um, is, is how you could apply that. It's being humble to the saints in the church and uh, not uh, showing, being in subjection, basically. Yeah. 
And if she had brought up children, hey, brought up children is not just hard work, but it's a good work. It's a good work with God, especially if they're in the uh, nurture and admonition of the Lord. That is a good work in the eyes of God. And so maybe maybe some people might not think it's a work. It's kind of just like the Christian lifestyle, but God looks at it as a good work. And your Christian lifestyle, if you raising up godly children, hey, people are watching. Women watch, especially with social media today. I mean, you might not think you have a big influence, and maybe you don't have a lot of followers. But all it takes is, you know, just that one person that's without to see your good works, and they're going to glorify God, which is in heaven. And one day, hey, maybe you can lead them to Christ. So maybe through that good work causes them to uh, um, go after God. Maybe they hear the gospel at some Baptist church or some believing church. Who knows? But the Bible clearly says that she had brought up a, a children. These are all good works. These are well-reported good works that before a church is supposed to support a widow, she needs to have these good works. And these are good works that God says is bringing up children. If she had lodged strangers, you know, we think about um, uh, many of the people in the Bible, but even in James, it says, you know, in James 2, if a, a brother or sister comes to you naked and destitute of food, you know, are you just going to say, depart in peace, be warmed and filled? Or are you going to entertain strangers, right? Obviously, if it's a brother in Christ, I don't think anyone here is going to say, hey, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But how much more if a stranger came to your house? I mean, someone you do not know said, hey, I need a place to stay tonight. Would you open your doors? I mean, that's something to think about. It says, having lodged strangers, if she had washed the saints' feet, if she had relieved the afflicted, I mean, relieving the afflicted goes both saved and unsaved. But, I mean, was that guy that was near death on the, on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, was he afflicted? Yeah, he was afflicted. And so relieving the afflicted is something that we as Christians should be doing. And, um, and it, it's, a, it's a good work, the Bible says. In 1 Timothy 5, 25, it says, Likewise also the good works are some manifest beforehand, and they that otherwise cannot be hid. Turn, if you would, to um, well, one chapter over, 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6, 1, it says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count unto their masters worthy of all honor, that the name of our, our God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. So men, here's one thing that servants can be obedient to when we have masters at work. How can we have good works to them that are without? Let as many servants as are under the yoke count unto their own masters worthy of all honor. Hey, your boss at work, he's worthy of all honor. Plain and simple. That's a Christian doctrine. If you don't think so, hey, read Romans 13. You know, it's, it's, it's all over the Bible. Obey them to have a rule over you. You know, it's not just in the house of God. It's outside of the church. Amen. And how are you going to be a good report? Are you going to really have a good report if you disrespect your master at work? You need to have a humble heart. And you'd be, hey, someone gives them honor. All the people respect them at church, uh, at the workplace. You need to respect them more. Double honor. It says um, that the name of God and his doctrine will be not blasphemed. So obeying your master is, is a doctrine of God, the Bible says. That the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. It is God's doctrine to give your master double honor. I mean, that's what that verse says. And it says that the name of God be not blasphemed. Again, who's looking at you? Nine times out of ten, it's the unbeliever. And the unbeliever is going to look and see how you treat your boss, and they're going to blaspheme God because of how you treat him. I mean, that's what the Bible says. The name, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved and partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. A couple of verses here, Leviticus 19:18. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So there's that famous verse. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Pretty easy, right? Who is thy neighbor? Right? It's the person that you are going to show um, you know, love to. Basically charity. I mean, this Roman, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the charity chapter, and it's all about love. It's all about charity. Yeah. And it's not just about soul winning. 
You know, soul winning doesn't cover a multitude of sins. I mean, you could be going out soul winning and not be right with God. You could be gone soul winning and have no charity. Is It's good for nothing. Right. Obviously, it's not good for nothing as in you're not profiting. I mean, you still get the soul saved, but you're not a complete Christian. You're not, if you're walking in sin and you're not walking in the spirit, you know, you need to walk in charity. Walking, walking in the spirit will bring forth that charity. Charity, uh, love, um, worketh no ill to his neighbor. And it says, Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear, or bear a grudge against any of the children of thy people. So not avenging. So obviously not avenging and going against somebody. When someone does you wrong, hey, it's not a Christian thing to just avenge yourself. You know, let God, you know, avenge you, right? Romans chapter 12. It said, uh, I'm not going to turn to it, but it's let God do the, do the recompense. He will recompense. It says, don't avenge and don't bear grudge against the people. And first, uh, Philippians 2, 14, it says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Again, there's another commandment, another good work, that if you're going to work, if you're doing all these things, but you're just walking around murmuring and disputing and talking ill and talking wicked about the people that are in charge or the circumstances you've you got going on, it's a commandment to do all things without murmur, murmurings and disputings. But what's the reason why? That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. Because sons of God shouldn't be walking around. And they shouldn't be murmuring and disputing. And here's the reason why. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom... Ye shine as lights in the world. Is that a coincidence? Another one that's saying, you know, don't, don't be murmuring, don't be disputing. That you're the sons of God. Yeah, you're in a wicked and perverse generation. But then it says, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. We need to show that light. We need to put it under a bushel. We need to show it and do good works to them that are without. Amen. First Corinthians 7. Um, if you would, turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. I'll read to you 1 Corinthians 7, 16. It says, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Now the application is unbelieving wives and unbelieving husbands. And it says if, if they um, are pleased to dwell with them, you know, let them dwell with them. It says that who knows whether you'll save your husband or who knows whether you'll save your wife. And why? It's because you're going to be, if you're pleased to dwell with them, you're going to be doing good works because you're a child of God. You're a son of God. You bring forth good fruit if you're in the spirit, if you're walking in Christ, if you're keeping the word in you. Doing good works, people see that. They, they just see that. They think of Christ and you are the example of Christ. Whether Who knows if thou shalt save thy wife. Or thou shalt save thy husband. But then I think later in that verse it says, but you know, but keeping the commandments of Christ. And you no, know, so that's to my next point is we're not without law to Christ, though. So one is that we need to do good works to all men. It's not just believers to all men. And this is very important. Two is some of those works that I went over. And then three is the not without law to Christ. Now you're there in 1 Corinthians 9. It says in 9.19, For thou, if I, for though, for though, if I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without, as without the law. Now watch. Being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. So he's saying, whether they're a Jew, I became as a Jew, as one under the law. Someone not under the law, I became as, you know, as someone that's not under the law. But he says, but not as under the, um, but not being, being not without law to God, under the law to Christ. So what's that saying is, you know, we need to be um, to be a light into the world, but we also need to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. That we should not be partaking in other men's sins 
or the world sins when we're showing our good works. And here's the constant battle, right? It's a constant battle of, you know, how much should I entertain the unbeliever or the stranger without being contaminated with sin, right? And so we ought not to ever go into sin in order to show our good works. That's ridiculous. You can show your good works somewhere else. You don't have to go into sin to get someone to say you don't have to go into sin to show your good works. And then it says, uh, verse 20, 23, And this do I for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. So this is for the reason of the gospel, so that he can win someone to the Lord. But 1 Corinthians 10, if you would turn to 1 Corinthians 10, just one chapter over. So we ought to be good works. We ought to have good works to them that are without. And then, but the Bible also says not to be unequally yoked to them um, that are unbelievers, right? And not to have fellowship with them um, to that what concord have Christ with Belial and, you know, 2 Corinthians. So, you know, what's the medium? You know, what's, what, what, wherein um, should we draw the line? And it's basically, if, if it causes you to commit sin, you know, it's not, it's not worth it. You know, you need to keep your holiness and and your testimony so that you know that you can shine unto them. You know, when you when you put a one drop of dirty water into a clean glass of water, it's all dirty. You know, if you're gonna go into the tiniest sin just to get someone saved, you ruin your testimony. You're, you're no longer a holy man of God. You know, you're, you're, you're you've humbled yourself to their estate, but it was it's too low. You know, you went too low. We need to make sure that we're still keeping ourselves unspotted from the world and being holy as we also are showing good works to the unbelievers. Amen. But 1 Corinthians 10, 27, it says, If any of them that believe not abide you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat and ask no question for conscience sake. So this is a scenario, right? It says, If any man, if any of them which believe not, so these are the unbelievers, people that don't believe, Bid you to a feast, so they welcome you to a party, right, or a feast, or what have you. This is a neighbor or something, right? Just had the 4th of July, let's say an unbelieving neighbor came over, hey, we're having some, some uh, barbecue over, you know, just want to invite you over. And it says, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, and asking no thing. So a lot of people will just say, well, if any unbeliever ever ask me to go to a feast or a barbecue, I'm just never going to go. Be not unequally yoked together. But that's not what it's saying. But we're, we're, we're not unequally yoked. Is like we're not taking part in their sin. We're not taking part in their, in their sin. You know, it even talks about in 1 Corinthians 5. You know, when it talks about when you're kicking someone out for fornication, and it says, you know, you know it's not that for, he says that when they kick someone out, he's not saying you don't keep company with fornicators because then you'd have to go out of the world. This world is full of fornicators. But you don't keep company with someone that's called a brethren that is a fornicator. And the same applies. Hey, you're going to be around people that are in a lot of sin. But you know what? If, a, if they call themselves a brother or in that sin, you ought not to be have fellowship with them. And you know what? It says, it says, and ye be disposed to go. Now, what's disposed? And if disposed is like you're is inclined or willing. So it's saying if someone asks you to go to, uh, let's say, a barbecue or something, and you're willing to go, go. And whatsoever is set before you, eat and ask no question for conscience sake. Now, here's the reason why, obviously. If any man say unto you, this is sacrifice, this is an offered in sacrifice unto idols, Eat not for for the sake uh, of eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So one, it says, if you be disposed to go, or if you're inclined to go, or if, if you want to go, you know, there's no problem if someone invites you to say, "Yeah, I want to go." You know, I maybe I could uh, you know be a good witness to somebody, right? Now, obviously, obviously, God gives you the judgment if they're inviting you to a bar. I don't recommend you stepping inside a bar. But if, if you have no if you have no inkling that that there's any ill will, that there's not going to be some lewd acts going on or some drunkenness or something, because who knows? I mean, you can't just assume that every unbeliever is just this drunken um, you know idiot that just you know just drinks all day. 
It says, if you're inclined to go, if you're disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you. You know, you go, and something's set before you, hey, eat it. You know, just entreat him. You know, just show your good works. But if he reveals to you that it was sacrificed to an idol, you don't take part. So here's the thing. We need to go in places where we can show our good works, but we ought not to be of the world. We need to be in the world, but not of the world. Amen. We need to keep the law to Christ. We not to eat anything sacrificed to idols. Hey, if you go what? You go to a barbecue, and then someone offers you a beer? Nope, no beer. You know what? Thanks, and probably uh, I'll probably won't be coming here again. But thanks for entertaining me, or you know, or just you know, whatever they offer before you. Once you know it's sin, you're to stand your ground. You're to tell them in in peace and love, obviously. And what's the reason why? It even says. Eat not for his sake that showed it. So if someone gives you a plate of meat, this steak was sacrificed to Dagon or whatever. Hey, you know what? That looks good, but I'm not going to eat it. I, everything that's on this earth and the fullness thereof is the Lord's, right? I'm not going to eat of that. Hey, you giving me a beer? I don't want any part of it. Right. You, you offer me whatever sin you want. I don't want any part of it. And here's your, here's your thing. I'm a Christian. I'm a son of God. Right. You know, you're in this world. You're a light of this world. How are they ever going to know you're a Christian or ever see your good works and see that you're a holy man of God who doesn't drink, who doesn't eat things sacrificed to idols, if you never put yourself in that situation? Obviously, again, you should use wisdom and not just go put yourself into the dirtiest of situations. But when there's no ill will and you're just out, you know, just being a friendly neighbor and a sin is presented unto you, hey, no thanks. I'm a child of God. And what is that going to show him? For his sake that showed it. You're going to witness to him, hey, this man doesn't drink. This man's a Christian. And then, I mean, it just, it ruins the testimony of Christ when, when a bunch of Christians are just in a bunch of sin. Or, or, or even, even wine drinkers. You know, and, and that's kind of another topic. I don't want to get into that. But the Bible says, be not among wine drinkers. I mean, if you have a Christian who thinks, you know, drinking wine is okay. And you have a Bible verse that says, Be ye not among wine bearers. I mean, if you're a Christian, hey, I'm glad you're saved, but I'm not supposed to be around you. You're a wine drinker. I don't, I don't fellowship with wine drinkers. And so what is it to him? How's his testimony? When, if you ask, you that go soul winning, if you ask somebody at the door, hey, let me ask you a question. Do you think the majority of Christians who claim Christ, do you think they drink alcohol or don't drink? I'd be willing to bet most of them would say they probably abstain from alcohol. That's just the Christian thing to do, right? Obviously, you have denominations of, like, you know, Catholicism, which is, like, heavily into, you know, alcohol or whatnot. But abstaining from alcohol is kind of like a well-known thing that, hey, you know what? Even the people at work, hey, he doesn't drink, you know, he's a Christian. Oh, okay, I understand that, you know, he's religious or whatever. You know, whether he agrees with it or not, he knows, hey, you know what? Majority of Christians don't drink. I understand. But what kind of testimony is it when there's a Christian who says, yeah, I drink. You know, on occasion, you know, I celebrate it, you know, whatever. What is he thinking of Christ? You know, Christ allows wine drinking. When the Bible says, be not among wine bibbers. And again, that's another topic, but we don't want to ruin our testimony. That was the point. And our testimony is key. Testimony is very crucial to them that are without. So the point of the sermon is to have good works. The works are to all men. The works are to not just people in the church. And the, yes, they should be to the people in the church, but we need to increase more and more. And we need to, although we increase more and more in good works to our fellow man, our women, uh, you know, we ought to stay under the law of Christ and not to partake of sin while we're giving a good word and giving a good testimony for our Lord. All right? Amen. Let's bow and pray. Lord, I pray that uh, you would uh, just uh, bless the rest of tonight, Lord, bless the singing, and I thank you for everything that you've done for us.